So um, I have to confess to you this weakness that I have. I know y'all are going, we know many of them, so really. <laughs> but there's this one weakness I've noticed lately, and it's when I'm on social media that there are these videos that suck me in every time. And I just can't help but watch them. And there are these stories of these, like, crusty, mangy old dogs that have been abandoned and they're malnourished and they're afraid and then some human finds them and tries to reach out to them. You've seen them, haven't you, right? And at first the human's like trying to reach out to the dog and the dog's like, ah, you know, they're baring his teeth and, and they don't want anything to do with them. And, and so over time the person will just keep coming back and coming back and eventually get to the place maybe where they can, where it'll take food out of their hand um, but they don't want to get too close because they don't want, want the human to catch them, you know. And so what you see then over time, and this, it's usually like the dog's in a field or a forest or behind the dumpster at Walmart or somewhere weird. And, and, and so this person just keeps coming back just to, to finally befriend this dog. And eventually he gets close enough to take the dog home. And usually the dog's kind of freaking out because he's like never been in a home before and what are you doing with me? And then then he learns to trust the person and eventually then he starts to eat and he gets a bath and he meets these other dog friends there's always other dog friends and the two end up being best friends and the dog has this new wonderful life that they never knew existed before um, i love happy endings like that don't you i love it when a creature finds love and a best friend, and it changes everything. And to me, it's just confirmation that, that everybody needs a best friend, even dogs. Well, today we are continuing our series, Let Me Tell You About My Jesus. And last week we talked about how Jesus is with us. Do you remember? He's with us all the time, and he wants to be with us. And that's why we call him Emmanuel, because he came to earth to be with us. And today's description of Jesus is kind of like that. It's not really a name, it's more of a description, but today we're going to talk about how Jesus is a friend of sinners. So that description of Jesus was actually given to him by the Pharisees. You know, the religious leaders that had all these rules and liked to condemn people who didn't belong. And, and they didn't like Jesus and in this one part in Scripture, Jesus was talking about John the Baptist. And, and you may remember John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. He came before him to kind of prepare the way, to tell people that Jesus was coming. And, and he baptized people, and he told them to repent of their sins. And, um, and he had this great ministry. And, well, the religious leaders of the day didn't like John either. They felt like he was pulling people away from the Jewish faith or at least from their leadership. And then um, one day they were talking to Jesus, and, and they were criticizing John the Baptist, and he kind of exposed their hypocrisy. And this was in Luke chapter 7. And here's what Jesus said. He's talking about what hypocrites they are, right? And he says, For John the Baptist didn't spend his time eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he's possessed by a demon right? Because John the Baptist was a little weird, right? And that's what they said about him. The son of man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. And so what you have here is this is what the Pharisees were saying about Jesus, that he is a glutton and a drunkard. Was Jesus those things? He was not, right? This is fake news. This is like the original version of fake news. They were lying about him to discredit him. And in the process, then, they also called him a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. And to them, that was an insult. Why would anybody follow Jesus? He's a friend of sinners. They were trying to discredit him. And later, you see in Luke 15, they say it again. 
It says tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. That just climbed all over them, that Jesus would take time to eat with people who had sinned. Who does he think he is? And in response to that, then Jesus tells them these series of parables, the first of which is the parable of the lost sheep. Let me read it to you. He says, so Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. You see, the lost sheep is a person who has wandered away from God. That's a sinner. And Jesus' mission was to bring them back to God through repentance and forgiveness. And so Jesus says, yes, you see, I came to be a friend of sinners. Indeed, they are the very reason he made the journey from heaven to earth. One of my favorite biblical examples of that is the story of Zacchaeus. You know that story? Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Actually, he was the chief of the tax collectors. And they were one of the most worst regarded people of the day. Nobody liked the tax collectors. They took money from people on behalf of the government, but they were often corrupt, and they extorted more money from people than they were supposed to get. So they were thieves, and they had power, and they abused that power so that they could live in luxury. They were not people that any decent person wanted to hang out with. And Zacchaeus was probably the worst of the worst by reputation. One day Jesus was walking into Jericho and the crowds had gathered around to see him. And Zacchaeus was apparently a little vertically challenged. And he was trying to find a way to see Jesus, right? Do you remember the story? So he climbed up in the tree so that he could see this Jesus that everybody was talking about. Jesus passed him by, and then he looked up into the tree, and he said, do you know what he said? Zacchaeus, you come down from there. <laughs> I'm coming to your house today. So there's like a children's song that says that, right? And talks about Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. <laughs> and in that song, it always says that Jesus looked up at him and said, Zacchaeus, you come down from here. I don't think Jesus actually said it that way. That looks like he did something wrong, doesn't he? I think it was more like Zacchaeus. Come down. I'm coming to your house for dinner. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? He was just hoping to get a glimpse of Jesus. I don't think he was counting on being noticed up in that tree. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks by and says, Yo, I want to hang out with you. And coming to, the, to his house would have been the greatest honor for Zacchaeus. There's a good chance it had been a long time since anybody had come to his house. But this was a sign of acceptance. For Jesus to welcome Zacchaeus into his life and to want to go into his home. Those who were watching thought it was awful. Why would you go to his house? Nobody goes to his house. Don't you know who he is? 
why would you want to accept him? No decent person would be caught hanging out with him. And here's, here's how, Luke, how Luke 19 explains that it happened after that. Starting with verse 6, he says, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. And don't you kind of see him kind of skipping along? Come on, Jesus, come to my house. Let's go. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. And so there, once, you, once again, you see that Jesus is being berated for being a friend of sinners. But that's exactly who he was. They thought it was an insult, an indictment of his poor character. But you know what it really was? It was the best news ever. Jesus is a friend of sinners. And you know why that's the best news ever? Because each one of us has been a sinner. Scripture says that, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so the good news for Zacchaeus is that Jesus still wanted to be his friend. And the good news for us is that Jesus still wants to be our friend, even though we have let him down. I'm pretty sure that the Pharisees or the religious people of the day would have looked down upon me at some point, how about you? I'm pretty sure that every one of us here can think of at least one time when we chose our own plan instead of God's plan. We thought more about what would please or honor ourselves than we did about what would please or honor our God. You see, that's sin. What makes us a sinner is that we have this tendency, this fleshly side of us, that wants to choose our way instead of God's way. But in spite of that, Jesus wants to be a friend. How ridiculous is that? Doesn't he know? Yes, he knows. He could have been ashamed to be seen with the likes of us. But instead, he chooses to walk alongside us. And even more than that, he chose to give his life up for us. Let me read to you from John 15. Starting with verse 13. John 15, 13 says, this is Jesus talking. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And isn't that exactly what he did? And he says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves, but now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. And this is my command, that you should love one another. I think my favorite part of that is that you didn't choose me. I chose you. You were up in that sycamore tree just hoping to get a glimpse when Jesus cho chose you. And he's not just a friend. He's the kind of friend that would give himself up for you. He proved his love for you when he went to the cross. I wonder how many friends have ever loved you that much. And not only did he do that, but then he goes to his father on behalf of us. Did you hear that? He wants the father to give us everything that we need. And he says, "What? I'll take you to the father. He's the kind of friend that introduces you to his dad. And there's another passage in Romans that I want to share with you from Romans chapter 5. And I think Paul explains it so well here. Starting with verse 6. 
He says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. And so you see, that's why we sing, I am a friend of God. I found a friend in Jesus not because I'd earned it, not because I deserved it, not because I was worthy, but because while I was lost, while I was a lost sheep, choosing my own way, taking my own path, Jesus saw fit to go to the cross for me so that that relationship could be restored. That's the kind of friend we have in Jesus. And our friendship with Jesus allows us to become a friend of God. You know God, the creator, the one who made you, the one who spoke the world into existence, the one who the wind and the waves obey, the one who counts every hair on your head and sees every tear that falls from your eyes. That God wants to be your friend. Right? Jesus could have done something different, right? He could have come to earth and only hung out with the people who already looked righteous. He could have spent all of his time in the temple patting people on the back for being obedient. There's a lot of things that Jesus could have done that might have made more sense. But instead, he came and hung out with the people who were enemies of God. Who were choosing their way instead of God's way who were baring their teeth and running away from God at every chance they had. That's who Jesus came for. He could have stayed with the 99 and let that lost one go. But instead, he chases after the lost sheep or the lost dog or the lost sinner and says, I want to be your best friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. That's a pretty amazing friend. Instead of going after the righteous and the perfect people, he went after the lost, the wounded and the hurting and the distant and the confused, the ones that were staring at the bottom of a glass again or wondering how they got into this bad relationship. The ones who were getting hooked on images they had found online. The ones who were willing to step over whoever it took in order to be successful. He came for the ones who would do whatever it takes to numb the shame they feel inside. He came for the ones that spiritual people look down on and don't want their children to sit next to who think should be kept on the outside of the church door. Those are the ones Jesus came to be friends with. Those are the ones that he looked at and said, they need a friend. I need to go find them and bring them back. And he still does that today. Through his spirit working in us and through us. Jesus invites us into a friendship with him, no matter who we are, because he is a friend of sinners. And you know what one of the coolest things about having Jesus for your friend is? He changes your life. He doesn't leave you where you were. He keeps coming back until you're ready to go home with him. He doesn't give up on you, nor does he sit in the dirt and in your sin with you, saying that it's okay. 
He invites you to join him as a friend in his father's family. I think that's pretty amazing. Do you remember Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus was all excited that Jesus was coming to his home. To have Jesus as a friend changed everything. But it also changed Zacchaeus. And so if we look at what happened to him, because Jesus chose to come and visit him, it's pretty amazing. It says that while the other people were grumbling about how Jesus shouldn't be hanging out with him, meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. You see, Zacchaeus was changed. Zacchaeus, who made his living cheating people, is all of a sudden standing there going, I'm going to give it all back. I'm going to give up my wealth. I'm going to pay back everybody I harmed. Zacchaeus was not the same person that was sitting up in that tree because Jesus had become his friend. And Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. So you see what Jesus is saying? You, this is exactly who I came for. And when he says that salvation has come to this house, it's not because Zacchaeus is going to make things right. No, salvation came first. And then Zacchaeus said, I'm going to make things right. So Zacchaeus didn't have to earn his way to be Jesus' friend. But when he became Jesus' friend, that's when everything changed. That's when he decided, I don't want to live for me anymore. I want to live for you. And that's the kind of friend that Jesus is. My friends, I think in the church we've gotten it wrong sometimes that that sometimes we focus a lot on Jesus being our friend, but we think that he's going to stay our friend as long as we keep sinning. And it doesn't really matter because he's a friend of sinners. But Jesus came to be friends of sinners so that he could change them because they were lost. He came to bring the sinners back into the kingdom where holiness could be found. That's who Jesus is, and that's the kind of friend he is. He's not the kind of friend that would leave the dog behind the dumpster at Walmart forever. No, he wants to bring you home, clean you up, and give you a new life. That's why he came. And that's why we celebrate that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Not so that we can remain sinners, but so that we can look back and know that that's who I used to be. But now I'm a friend of Jesus. And because he is my friend, I'm not the same person anymore. And you know what happens when that happens? All of our shame is gone. The world might still look at us and go, you know what that person did? You know what I heard? I saw an article about him. Do you know what it said? Jesus said, it's all been wiped clean because this is my friend and that's what matters. I am a sinner who has been redeemed because of the friend I have in Jesus. How about you? We don't have to eat out of the dumpster anymore. We don't have to run away and be afraid or try to hide or bare our teeth. Instead, we embrace the best friend that we could ever know I think other people need to know that too don't you And one of the reasons I wanted to do this series so much is because I really believe that the world doesn't know who Jesus is and I think it's so important that they know that Jesus wants to be with them first of all that he's not somebody who lived and died years ago, but he's somebody who's alive today and whose spirit wants to come and dwell inside of us. But I think the world also needs to know that Jesus didn't come to condemn them. He came to save them. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. I don't 